I should have tried the mic. You're fine. What is I'll just, I'll just call I was going to say, like, I'm, I'm one of the only ones that knows how to run the soundboard. But I can't be two places at once. Ah! It's all right. It's all right. just fine back here. Okay, I'm just fine. I'll just, I, I'm not even using a mic, so that's good. Projection. I'll use some water later. All right. Well, let me, uh, let me, let me, can I just pray? My mind is going uh, a million other directions at the second, and I need to just concentrate. Father, I'm just so grateful uh, for another opportunity to speak for you and to share with this body of believers your word. And so, God, I pray, Father, apart from any other distraction, uh, God, that your word would be spoken, and Lord, that your spirit would be welcome here to speak to us and to change us, to challenge us, to be more like you. God, I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. I was uh, thinking about this week's message. We have been walking through, thank you, Rachel. Uh, we've been walking through uh, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. And we, we talked through the Beatitudes for a little while, seeing how Jesus challenged us to the core of who we are and sometimes says statements that really shake us. And through them, though, we learn how to live like a king. Jesus lived opposite of what any king or any natural leader had ever done before. And so it does it challenge us. And, and even more so, as I was continuing to study the Sermon on the Mount, he, he, he challenges not only us, but he challenged even the believers, the way that they thought, the, the, the Jewish um, leaders, even the way that they thought that things should have been. He, he was challenged that. He was bringing such a new... Um, new way of thinking that it was actually some of their hope that they would be able to um, it was it was some of their hope that they would be able to dismiss Jesus' teachings because they were so new. They were waiting for an opportunity to say, oh, this is just like gibberish. This is just it's junk. This isn't something of God. Uh, it, it, yeah, continue on, Jesus. But he continued on in truth and in spirit, and it was radical. But it was a radical way that he wanted us all to accept. And today, as we look through Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be in verse 17 through 20 today. We're going to see that uh, he, he speaks again this, this new way, this new thing. But it was so impactful, it challenged even the most elite believers at the time. And I think it challenges us today, too. <coughs> But what I've noticed about myself, and uh, now being a parent, I notice this even more. But uh, and when I was a manager, dealing with people at Curry and Lots, I was I, this is a pretty common thing. But did I really think that that we people are expert at justifying ourselves? Got a few nuts. Okay, yeah. So you're you're in the boat with me, right? Uh, all of a sudden, I make a mistake, or as a parent now, I tend to make the mistake, and, and then uh, all of a sudden, there's immediately a justification to what I just did. Uh, I think it's really neat. We we have this unique ability, and we're we're usually super creative with the ability to convince ourselves that we're okay, right? It wasn't it wasn't uh, it wasn't the best choice, you know, but at least it's it's going to be okay, right? Or, or you always say this, yes, I know I shouldn't have done that, but uh, I think, you know, everything's going to turn out all right. It's going to be, it's going to be okay. Do you, do you people have used that line before, right? Or really, we get creative about convincing ourselves that we're good enough, right? That the company that turned us down, that uh, we're good enough for the, the college that rejected us, we're good enough for that guy or girl that didn't call us back, or, or we're good enough for that acquaintance that, that, uh, that we never built a relationship with. Uh, no matter what happens, most of us have this ability to make ourselves feel better about those situations. We want to kind of build ourselves up, protect ourselves. When we excuse or justify things that happen, or our behaviors, we, we often try to do this. But usually when we're doing these things, when we're trying to justify ourselves, or trying to make sure everything's okay, and then, you know, make ourselves feel a little better, we're actually refusing to recognize that somebody else has a standard that we don't measure up to. Think about, oh, it's, it's just the company's fault. It's just, 
it's just the, that person's fault. It's just this situation. But not the fact that I didn't measure up to what they wanted. When a college rejects us, we just like, uh, we should face it, that we didn't meet their standard. When we, the, when the swim team, anybody on a swim team? I think any sports team, I think swim team, that I was thinking about the, uh, the freedom swim again this week. But, all right, when the, free, when, the, when the swim team rejects us, just face it, you didn't meet that standard. When you didn't get the promotion, they weren't looking for you because you weren't expert enough. Is that hard to say? Oh. When you are rejected from a loan, maybe it's because you have bad credit and you, you have too much debt already. But we hate the pain. We hate the feeling of the fact that we didn't live up to that standard. We hate the fact that, no, they rejected me, that there's something wrong with me, or there's something I fell short of. And, and we justify ourselves. Oh, they didn't know how good I was. I was the best swimmer out there. Oh, they just don't like technical managers. That's the that's the problem. I didn't get the promotion because they didn't like technical managers. They, no, they just asked the wrong questions on the test. And that's why I didn't qualify for the position. Everybody has a lot of debt these days. I mean, it's okay. Sadly, the way people justify themselves publicly, they also do so spiritually. And this is where Jesus' words come into play this morning, that there is a measuring stick. There is a uh, standard that is to be up upheld. And what's interesting about this passage today is there's a lot of people that thought they were doing it right. And so we're going to look at that even, even more so and see, okay, God, what is it? Is it just the doing right? Because you know, uh, we're going to get into this a little bit. I love checklists. You guys have learned that a little bit about me. I like tasks. I mean, making the list and checking it off, you know, doing it twice and, and getting everything said. And I feel good about myself when I get to the bottom of the checklist. Anybody else checklisters? Okay, all right, all right. You know, get down to the bottom of the task list. And I'm like, all right, I feel good. But Jesus takes these things a step further like he always does. And it speaks to us this morning. And I pray that it encourages us this morning. And we're going to look through this a couple weeks in a row because I think it applies to a, a few different scenarios. Next week, we're going to talk to, to parents and to leaders. So if you're in a position of leadership or you're a parent or maybe a parent-to-be, one day you ascribe to lead others. We're going to talk about that next week. What does this passage speak to those individuals? But today, we're going to focus on this spiritual aspect of desiring to justify ourselves. I feel like at times right now, we're living in the book of Judges. Judges is a, a book of the Old Testament. And, and in, uh, in the book, the statement is made that everyone does what is right in his own eyes. And I feel like that. When we think, we think about this uh, desire to justify ourselves, it, I think its root is in that everyone does what is right in his own eyes. And we could probably add this, and I would add this to the verse if I was thinking just about society today and in Madison 2019, I was like, and is convinced that it's the right thing to do. They, they do what they want, and they do what they want with their lives. They, they do whatever they, they find right in their own, and they're convinced that that's the right thing. And you can't convince me otherwise. People have their own ideas about righteousness or godliness, and, are, and have decided that they're going to live as consistently as they can to their standard of rules that they built for themselves. Our culture has lost the desire to appeal to a standard outside of yourself. Yes. And this is the difficulty because there is a standard that is outside of ourselves that teaches us and shows us how we measure up to who Christ is. And the whole point of that is to point us to the one that we are in need of to allow ourselves to stand in that right standing. We're going to get to that. What does righteousness mean? That's going to be probably about the third the third lesson that we get into, the third sermon from this passage, will be about the righteousness of Christ and how we are in desperate need of righteousness. We're in desperate need of right standing because we don't measure up. But thanks be to God that he sent his son Jesus. And so through him we can receive his righteousness, his right way of living, his following after the Father, submitting himself fully. 
Praise the Lord that Jesus lived the life I could have lived because each of us are required to live it. So we definitely, what we also find in the society is that we don't want to share our standards with others. Like we have this thing, like I, I have this standard, but I don't want you. I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to cause you offense, so I'm not going to share with you what my standard is, and, and, and vice versa. And we're all just trying to appease each other, living on our own, and with all the confusion. And then Jesus shows up on the scene, and I want you to encourage you this morning that Jesus showing up on the scene, bringing a standard, is actually greater than what uh, than what even the biblical context and biblical hears of Jesus's words. Or understanding. So let's read here Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17 through 20. Let's look at this passage that brings about this subject of self justification. And let's see here, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot. Cross every T, dot every I. Will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments teaches others to do the same and will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Why is our standard of righteousness flawed? I said this earlier, we try to justify ourselves. Why is the, why is the standard of righteousness flawed? One, because we're flawed. I say this every week, probably up here. I'm not perfect yet. I make mistakes. I yelled at my son this morning because he wasn't doing you, he was doing you, yeah, yeah, you know? And I'm like, oh, again, Lord Jesus, I need you to cover me. But two, it's because we like to make lists. How does list get us in trouble? Like I said, to-do lists are my comfort zone. When I go to a situation, immediately, I'm like, these are the things that need to be done, here's how we can change them, and this is the way that it will make it better. Let's go for it, let's do it. It's comforting to me to be able to be in a situation where I know exactly what is asked of me. Anybody been in a, in a situation where you're not sure, it's like kind of a boogious, and you're like, whoa, I don't know, I feel uncomfortable. I love rules as a kid. Man, if mom and dad gave me a rule, I'm like, great, I know I can go all over here, and there's a boundary, and it was beautiful for me. I've had many friends, I have siblings, I have uh, family members, and they, you know, they don't mind seeing what's beyond that, that boundary. I was kind of comfortable with it. I enjoyed it. The problem is that this of righteousness is dangerous. Because we feel righteous if we've checked off the list. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the, the very individuals that, that Jesus is, is contrasting here are these people that were really great at list making. They made lists of their list, of the list, just to make sure they didn't do the things they weren't supposed to do. They thought by breaking it down into all these extra things that they would build themselves up and they would feel really comfortable with it. I love the looks that I'm getting today because it means that it's speaking to you just like it was speaking to me this week. So this is good. I was thinking about this. I could put on my list, love my wife. But then I know about myself and I know the truth is that if I put just love your wife on my list, it actually isn't like quantifiable, right? The, the best thing about a, a task list, right? To make it a task, it has to be measurable, right? So if I put love my wife, no, nope, that doesn't that doesn't quite fit the list. So then I have to say, oh, okay, I'm gonna buy my wife flowers. I'm gonna cook a meal for her. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna clean the house, and I'm gonna show all these things to be true that I love my wife. But I can do all those things. And some of you guys are in the room, and you know this. You're in a relationship. You can do all those things, but there still isn't 
love at the center of those tasks. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Oh, so I used to do this to Rachel. I've told, I've told people this a few times. So Rachel is a, is a gift giver. So like her love language, the way that she expresses love to people, she loves to give gifts to people. So when we were first married, early in our, in our marriage, Rachel would go to the store all the time. And every time she would go to the store, you know, it's a grocery shop or whatever it would be, she would come home and she would give me a candy bar. And I thought, oh, this is so, so awesome. She got, she got me a candy bar. She would give me a candy bar. Well, if you know anything, I'm not, I don't always super enjoy, like, candy. Like, if you give me a, a piece of fruit, or we've learned beef jerky, she gives me beef jerky now. She gives me a piece of fruit when she goes to girls. Or she share her love for me. But I would, I would take the candy bar, oh, thank you, honey. And I would put it up on the shelf. Because I wasn't ready to eat the... Eat the candy bar. And and then a few weeks would go by and she would say she, she would say, Hey, then aren't you gonna eat the, the candy bar? And I said, Well yeah, you know, I'll get to it. And then eventually she'll eat it instead of giving it. And, and this would happen. It would happen. I have to admit I'm not kind of maybe it take it takes me a little while sometimes. It would happen for years. She would do this routine. She would come and she would get the candy bar. She would give it to me. I'll say, "Okay, thank you." I'll put it back on me. And I mean, and we, we finally learned after you know sometimes those those tests and books and stuff are really good to read and, and get. It. And it was, yeah, Rachel said it's seven, it was seven years later when finally we're reading this book and it came it came to my attention. She's been telling me she loves me every time she buys these candy bars every week for years. And I was just saying, "Okay, you know." I don't love you, I don't, I don't accept your love. <laughs> anyway, you learn things. You grow older, you mature, you learn how to, how to love. And, but back to the, getting back to the, the task list, we, we make these tasks and, and they have to be measurable. But the problem is, is that it, 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 it fails to bring to us, when we talk about our righteousness, it fails to bring to us the right the righteousness, the right standing for the Lord, because if anybody should have been praised in this message that Jesus is giving, it should have been the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were making the list, they were checking it twice, they were doing a great job at getting the task done. Remember this, checklists are flattering, but it's the heart that matters. So Jesus addresses us list followers. He addresses, he, he addresses us justifiers in this passage. That our good isn't good enough. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were, were good at following their list. Somebody saying, Pastor, we don't need to follow a law, the law is nothing. No, that's why Jesus steps into the Jesus steps into the in the scene. He, he's saying all these new statements. He's he's bringing the beatitudes. He goes on in the Sermon on the Mount and brings all these new ways to follow follow the commands. Uh, but he he makes this statement and he makes it firmly in verse seventeen. He says, "Don't think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets." He's not getting rid of them. He has not abolished them. He is fulfilled. He is the fulfillment. Of all the laws and the prophets. Praise God. He fulfills it in multiple different ways. The first thing that he, the first way that he fulfills it is he fulfills all the righteous requirements, all the actions that are required. That's the first way Jesus fulfills it. Why? Or how do we know this? Jesus said, and we, we even spoke about it last week when, uh, when the evangelist was here. He said, he only does what the Father was doing. Jesus fulfills the, the law and the prophets. Why? By every action that he did, it was a it followed every T crossed, every I dotted. He followed it. He was obedient to it. He also fulfills it, and, and, and some scholars will say this, he fulfilled it. Why? Because he supported the law. He supported obedience to God the Father. He wasn't one that said, no, you should go do your own thing, or, or yes, your, your, your ways of righteousness, or your ways of justification, they're good enough. No, he said, be obedient to the Father. He supported it, he fulfilled it by 
by encouraging us obedience. Others, uh, I was looking at, said that he completes the law. We're going to get in, in, into the way in the third sermon of this series. We're going to look at why it's so important that Jesus completed the law. He fulfilled it. He, he completed it. He did everything that was necessary. And why, what that means for us, that His righteousness can now be attributed to us. This is like good news stuff. Fourth way that is emphasized by Matthew, the writer of our gospel, is that he fulfilled every prophecy of the Old Testament. How do, how do I see that, Pastor? How do you know that he would fulfill it? Matthew took it, like, uh, took it like as a task. I'm going to show you how much Jesus fulfills what was prophesied in the Old Testament. He starts this way in chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 22, the telling of the virgin birth. Why was that so important for for Matthew to put in there? Why? Because the Jews were looking for somebody. They were they had all these prophecies written down, and they were looking for one born of a virgin. And so by Matthew putting that in, in, in chapter 1, verse 22, it's a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Again, Matthew continues in, in Matthew 2, verse 4 and 6, and says it says in a prophecy that he would be born in Bethlehem. That's found in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. So again, a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Again, it says that he would be one that was called out of Egypt. And in chapter 2, verse 15, Matthew made sure he put this in there too, the fact that they had gone down to Egypt. And that prophecy was recorded in Hosea 11, verse 1. It also predicted uh, in the Old Testament there was a prophecy that went forth that there would be weeping because children were going to be, uh, that sorry, mothers would be weeping over their children. Well, as Jesus was born and the, the, the wise men came and there was a decree that was given, right, so that all the young would be slain. And then it was fulfilled from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15, that the mothers were weeping. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, it said that there would be, uh, it says that there was a voice from the wilderness. John the Baptist, if we're familiar with that day, a biblical character, was one that was went out into the wilderness and he was baptizing people, a baptism of repentance. He was preparing the way, preparing people's heart for Jesus, the one to come. Well, this wasn't just an awesome little story. It was a fulfillment of a prophecy from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, that there would be one in the wilderness calling forth. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, it says that Jesus was a great light, that a great light had come and brought him out of the darkness. Well, that wasn't just a simple word. It was a fulfillment of a prophecy. It was from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And so, in this way, Jesus steps on the scene and he's saying all these new things and people think he's this radical teacher. He, he's saying, no, I'm saying these new things. I'm adjusting what we're we'll good at. I'm adjusting your heart. I'm adjusting you back. And so he says, I'm a fulfillment. These things haven't passed away. No, they're complete in me. And Matthew, the writer of this gospel, does an excellent job speaking over and over again the ways that he fulfills the prophecies of old so that, if we're talking about the context of which this is written, the hearers of this word, so that they're without excuse. They know that the, the, the prophecy has been fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus continues on the Sermon of the Mount, and he says it multiple times as we'll get through uh, over the next couple months, we'll get to these different ways that Jesus says, you have heard it said this way. So it was written this way, and this is the way that you guys have thought. You have, have made your task list to be able to complete this, but I say to you, and he begins and continues to radically change this. Jesus, Jesus in this statement, is cutting at our list of justification. And he's teaching us that as a, a life lived righteously before God must be lived with heartfelt obedience. With heartfelt obedience. 
verse 19 through 20. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What is Jesus doing here? Is he telling us that we have to go back to obey on the law for salvation? Absolutely not. No way. But he is connecting a faithful heart of obedience with those that assume they have position and kingdom just because of their self-righteousness. He's connecting the faithful heart of obedience to those that assume they have a place in the kingdom because of their self-righteous obedience. If they believe by their acts of righteousness, and by their acts of tasking off and checking off the list that they would reach the kingdom of God, Jesus confronts them in this moment and says, you're so wrong. Because this is what is at the root of even the law. So this wasn't something new that Jesus was representing. He shows up in the scene uh, at years after the law has given, years after the, the Jewish faith had been established. He's not setting up something new here. This is where the hearers got it wrong. He was actually, 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 actually. <laughs> Reestablishing the foundation in which the law was given. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 and 5 says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your strength. Israel had forgotten to love with their heart. They made everything pretty. They got everything in order. They followed the rules to the 10th, 15,000th degree. But they didn't love with their heart. They boasted because they could fulfill the letter of the law. They, they could fulfill it. They, they, they made it so much so that they could do it. They could make it. They, they're in it. They, they got it. They've got it all under control. They, they've lived up to the standard. They've, they've met all of the normalcy of the thought. But they've done it without a heart to say, God, I'm for you and I love you. This was the basis of our relationship with God. And this is the basis of what it means to be a Christian, is that we're in a relationship. God didn't want a whole bunch of robots following the tasks. He said, love me with all of you, with all of your being, love me. And then we know that from love, then produces these acts of obedience. Every married couple, we get that this morning, and it will go a long way too. Love is at the root of every act. So it's because I love Rachel that I'll sacrifice time, I'll have conversations with her, we'll go on date night every week, no matter what, unless her babysitter doesn't show up. But, you know, right? <laughs> we, we do these things by out of motive of love, not because, oh, I, I know, because I'm married, I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to do this. No! It's out of love that we go, hey, let's go spend time just staring at each other at a, at a, at a movie or at a coffee shop. Or, right? Why do we do these things? Why? Because it's from our heart. Jesus is reestablishing here. He's not some, saying something new. He's saying, let's go back and say, hey, it's about the love for the Father in which we create all of these obedient acts.
this morning as I was examining this again, it struck me. It speaks to two different people this morning. Two different groups of us. Maybe we're, maybe we're in both of them sometimes. Well, in the, the self-righteous justifier. I think I fall in that category many times too. Oh, it's okay. It'll work out. It's okay, that's just a slip up. It's okay, this, that's just what I'm used to. That's why I act this way or, or do these things. To the self-righteous justifier, Jesus stands in, in, in front of us this morning through his word and says, No, I fulfilled the law and the prophets. Every T was crossed, every dot, every I was done. There is, and, and he would say, there is, or what is he saying by that? There is a standard. And it's a standard not uh, that is outside of our own opinion. That's outside of ourselves. It's a standard that is the word of God. The one who cries, we should be holy just as he is holy. That's the standard. And so then the self-justification turns into a repentance. Oh Lord, I need you. I don't live up to this. Oh Lord, like the Psalms I read in, in Psalms chapter 25 this morning. Oh, I did sin. Oh Lord, let your steadfast love be gracious to me. Because there's a standard and it's outside of me. And I understand I don't I don't need that. And it's not okay. I need you, Lord. I need your salvation. And then also, to the rule follower, I've already confessed I'm in that one too. The task list maker, the I did everything right, he says to him, you can't do it. Your righteous task, your good works, your good behavior, your gold star that you received, it isn't enough. He said it this way in, in verses 19 through 20, it doesn't earn you a different position in the kingdom of God because of what you've done. And we'll get into the warning next week, the warning for those who are in, in leadership position or those who are influencing other people. Next week we'll get into that. But for now, he says, hey, it doesn't earn you anything. Where is your heart at? Check your heart this morning. Oh, Lord, have I made it such a rule-based thing that I, I have just accomplished all these things on my own, and, and God, I've done it apart from actual love for you, actual pursuit of you. And Jesus would invite those rule followers, me included, to pursue him. Pursue a relationship after him, to love on him, to depend deeply on Jesus, to change our heart, that we would first love him above all other things. And so this morning, that's the invitation that we have, to spend a few moments in prayer this morning, if, if whatever side you fall on, you say, yeah, I, I, I'm a self-righteous person. I, I, I have made for myself a standard. Hey, take a moment and say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, I want to live the way that you have laid it out to live. And then if you're on the other side, you say, yeah, I, I, I've done all the tasks. But yeah, Pastor, I hear you. I hear your Holy Spirit. I, I've done it without a love relationship with the Father. This morning, we have an opportunity Make it right and say, Lord, help me live as you live. Let me pray. Jesus, I thank you for your message this morning. And I think many of us in the room can identify with both of these, sometimes at the same time. God, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would transform us and we would be a people that you desire to have a people from Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says that we love you with all of our heart, all of our strength, all of our mind. God, I pray that you would set us right in your kingdom and we would receive from you grace to live for you with our whole heart, with our whole being. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to take a, a few minutes. I invite you to to pray, to take a moment to reflect on the word and say, Lord, help me 
to be like you. Help me to forego my list and, and to pursue you with love. Help me, Lord, to live by your standard and not by my justifications. If you would like me to pray with you, I would love to pray with you. I'll be up here, but let's take a, a few minutes before we head out and reflect on that.